Welcome to the Partnership Economy. This podcast explores the power of partnerships through candid conversations with industry leaders. Join our hosts, Dave Yavano, CEO, and Todd Crawford, co-founder of Impact.com, as they unpack the future of partnerships as a lever for scale and an opportunity to put the consumer first. Welcome back to the Partnership Economy. This is Dave Yavano, and I'm really excited to introduce today's guest. Eliza Charbonneau has been an active participant in the partnership economy, working at incredible companies like Disney, Walmart, and Jet.com. She has 10 years of experience driving growth for Fortune 100 companies and direct consumer startups, and actually started her career in law and finance. Eliza is currently the director of paid media at Disney Streaming, a direct-to-consumer business unit within the Walt Disney Company that oversees all consumer-facing digital video subscription services. She specializes in managing paid acquisition campaigns across various performance partners, including affiliates, influencers, loyalty partners, and brand partners, and now their paid media channel as well. In today's episode, we discuss the explosion of streaming services throughout and beyond the pandemic, and where Disney's streaming platforms fit into that landscape. Elisa shares her perspective on some of the smart partnerships that helped them stay relevant during the pandemic, lessons learned during her non-traditional career path, and her advice for other marketing teams hoping to take their partnerships to the next level. This was a great conversation, and I hope you enjoy listening. Welcome to this episode of the Partnership Economy Podcast. Today, I am joined by Eliza Charbonnel. Welcome to the podcast, Eliza. Hey, Dave. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here, and I can't wait for a conversation today. I first want to talk about Disney streaming. This is a product that has gone from zero to 100 real quick. It's a brand new streaming service that started only two years ago. It's really hard to believe. Already, I think, has over 100 million subscribers. And I think you might say that partnerships have played a pretty critical role in Disney acquiring subscribers for their new streaming service. So I was hoping, Aliza, that you could kind of start us off by just taking us back to the start of 2020. It was the start of a new year. It was also the start of a pandemic, which nobody uh, could see coming. And it was also the start of a brand new uh, service from Disney, Disney Streaming. And just first want to understand, what were your original go-to-market strategies you know, before launch? Yeah, no, I think that's a really interesting point. So I guess just to define the part of the company that I work for. So Disney Streaming is essentially our direct-to-consumer business unit within the Walt Disney Company's Disney Media and Entertainment Distribution, or DMED, segment. Essentially, uh, that segment oversees all of our consumer-facing digital video subscription services across the company. Um, So that includes Disney+, Plus, which now comprises of 137.7 million subscribers. We also have Hulu, which has 45.6 million subs. We have ESPN+, Plus, which is our industry-leading sports streaming service in the U.S. that has about 22.3 million subs. And then Star+, Plus, finally, which is our general entertainment streaming service in Latin America. So we have, as you can see, a pretty comprehensive suite of streaming services that really reach kind of all of the different consumers with various types of content, movies, series, shows, etc. And as you can imagine, so we launched Disney Plus in November 2019. It's crazy to think about it because it's, you know, so mainstream now and we have so many subscribers, but it's still a relatively new product and kind of in its infancy in terms of, you know, its maturity. I'd like to think a lot of that was driven by partnerships and a lot of the work that my team uh, is doing with all of our various partners that we manage. But, you know, I obviously have to acknowledge that there were a lot of like more macro trends happening here, too. Disney's a very diverse company, right? They're in travel, they're in hospitality, right? All of those segments of the Disney business, I would imagine, were pretty disrupted at the start of 2020. And, you know, possibly Disney streaming taking a higher priority. Did that play in at all, do you think, to how Disney's just kind of reacted to some of the macro challenges that were in front of it as a company? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Disney um, is pretty different because unlike some of the other, you know, players or competitors of ours in this space, It was really interesting to see at the start of the pandemic when all of the other divisions, you know, outside of DMED, the one that I sit in, were basically shut down or a lot of people were furloughed across the company. It was really, you know, upsetting to see that. But I think it made the work that my team does within the Disney streaming division all the more important and front and center. And truthfully, the company was already headed in the direction of really prioritizing and 
leaning in on its direct-to-consumer strategy through the Disney streaming segment. That said, of course, our parks, our cruises, our retail businesses are extremely core to what the company does. And, you know, I didn't even mention all of our studios um, and content teams. And, you know, they continue to be the engine that fuels Disney streaming. And Disney streaming would not exist without its it's incredibly strong brands, which are built through all these other touch points um, within the other divisions of Disney. Yeah, and so what, what I found fascinating at the start of 2020, what you, you, you took what was a challenge, you know, I'm thinking of like, I wanted to get in a couple examples of uh, partners that, that you launched, uh, especially during the pandemic. You guys got really innovative. Like, yes, hospitality travels down, but you've got, found creative ways to work with partners like Hilton, for example. Did you want to maybe talk about partnership with their honor system, for example, I think you had just any other ways in which you were thinking about um, ways to kind of overcome what, what others saw as, as, as a quite devastating impact to their business. When we saw that a lot of these industries were being impacted so heavily, we we basically saw that as an opportunity to kind of partner with partners or industries that would have maybe been a little bit more non-traditional for a streaming service to partner with. And so we really looked at the hospitality and travel verticals, primarily given those were so heavily impacted by the pandemic. So for example, when it came to hospitality, we actually decided to partner with Hilton. So they're obviously a huge hotel chain globally. You know, when Disney is looking for partners, we always try to look for partners that have a significant global footprint since we're available in 106 markets as of last week uh, with our most recent launches. So it's always helpful to us when partners that we work with have a lot of or as much scale as Disney. So Hilton was a great partner in that respect. And basically what we did was we plugged into their already existing loyalty ecosystem called Hilton Honors. And we essentially um, set up a co-marketing campaign where any Hilton Honors members who signed up for Disney streaming, so Disney Plus or the Disney Bundle, would become eligible for a certain amount of Hilton Honors points that they could then, you know, use towards their next hotel reservations or hotel bookings. So it was a really interesting partnership. Another example that we that we did was with TripAdvisor, who was also seeing a pretty significant challenge with, you know, the travel industry coming to a halt. So that was another another really cool one and fun one to work on. Any tips on on how you would approach a partner like that, you know, with regards to, hey, it's a, it's a new streaming service. Obviously, you get the Disney Disney brand behind you, so that helps uh, if you get a response, I think, from people. But, you know, these sorts of partnerships, you know, it's not like you're running an ad campaign, right? There's some real business development that's happening here. So any tips to the audience on, hey, once you've you've got a strategy that you think makes sense, you know, how you you might structure that sort of partnership or, or ways in which uh, to work together? Anything come to mind in terms of just tips for anyone in the audience? I will be pretty honest and upfront that, you know, it's not, there's no one size fits all approach. Like it is, they are admittedly quite challenging, even for a brand like Disney to structure. With that said, in terms of like a few tips, I would say definitely know your audience. Like if you're coming in and you're reaching out about a partnership, I would say try to formulate an idea or a pitch. Like these partnerships can be a little bit like vague or superfluous. So it's like, yeah, it's a great idea, like hypothetically, but like, how do you get down to the nitty gritty? How would it actually work? Like, are there mutual goals on both sides? And is there alignment there? Because if there isn't, like, you know, partnerships are a two-way street and it doesn't work if only one side is really invested and, and able to kind of extract value out of the partnership. So I would say kind of thinking about all of those things ahead of time before you tackle the initial conversation is definitely something that helps me and my team. Any learnings as well? We've talked about uh, some successful partnerships that you've been able to put together over the last few years, but maybe an example or two of a partnership that didn't go so well um, and any learnings from that? So I think one example that I like to talk about is, so a couple of, I guess it was two years ago or a year and a half ago when Cruella, the new Disney movie was released onto Disney streaming. It's a very like fashion and makeup oriented uh, movie um, based in London, set in London. And my team thought it would be really fun to partner with Sephora. Obviously, they're a global makeup retailer. um, And we just thought there would be like a really interesting synergy there. So we started going down the path of working with them and seeing what we could do and create together. And then unfortunately, you know, Disney being such a huge corporate company with so many teams that interface with external, you know, companies and partners, 
we realized that we actually could not partner with Sephora because MAC was actually the official makeup provider for the Corella movie. And that was something, you know, that like the studios teams were obviously very close to, but me sitting on the the Disney streaming uh, division had no idea about. And so, you know, I think not all partnerships work out and you learn a lot from the ones that didn't just as much, I feel, as you do from the ones that do. So I think, you know, that was just like a, a good reminder to, for my team to do all of our internal checks first before we kind of go down the, ro- the road of exploring partnerships that we actually, you know, can't even entertain in the first place. Anyone who works in partnerships can draw inspiration from the great work Aliza and her team have been doing at Disney. The way her team switched gears and stayed agile during the pandemic proves that there are always creative ways to drive revenue and stay relevant, even during challenging times. When the pandemic hit, Disney saw an opportunity to pivot and launch new partnerships with travel and hospitality brands that might not have been on their radar otherwise. This is a great example of a fresh and innovative approach that helped Disney and their partners continue engaging with consumers throughout the roller coaster of COVID-19. I wanted to go back to how you got your professional start because it was very much a non-traditional uh, career start um, to, you know, let's say, you know, an entry-level marketing job, you know, relative to the work that you're doing now. Do you share a little bit with the audience about how you got your professional start? Sure. I know. I never thought I'd be here today. So it's, it's funny to think back sometimes on how I ended up here, but um, I definitely have a very non-linear path. So I actually grew up in France. Um, in Paris. And I moved to the US to go to college. So I went to school in upstate New York. And I studied political science and government thinking that I was going to become a lawyer, probably an international rights lawyer. So naturally, though I wasn't ready to go straight to law school, I decided to get a job as a legal assistant in a corporate law firm here in New York. So I was at a white shoe law firm um, getting that experience. So I bought a bunch of pencil skirts and suits and, and did that whole thing. And you know, I think very quickly into into my my career in corporate law, I realized that it wasn't necessarily the right fit. I was essentially eating all my meals at work. I, I even did an all-nighter the first night and I learned that there's they store beds in the conference room floors in law firms. So that was an interesting uh, fact that I learned. Anywho, um, so from there, um, I actually uh, transitioned to working in the in-house legal department at Goldman Sachs because um, there were a lot of synergies and overlap between Goldman and the law firm that I worked at at the time. And then with that said, after the three years there, I, I sort of realized that I wanted to work in an industry that I could relate to a little bit more as a consumer. And that's where I started um, looking at a few different companies based in New York that piqued my interest. And I heard a little bit more about Jet.com. I, I thought it sounded super interesting. And so I, maybe we'll get into a little bit more about what Jet and Walmart were, but um, that's kind of how I ended up there. And I'm curious, the, going from Goldman Sachs to Jet.com, the role that you started with at Jet.com or, or uh, ultimately evolved into in, in partnerships, was that just serendipitous or was that kind of on purpose? So I had heard about Jet.com at the time. It was like a rising star in e-commerce and even billed as being potentially a competitor to Amazon, which now is, is sort of like funny to think about um, given Jet no longer exists, RIP. I think for me, it was, it was a super interesting business. I wanted to get that startup experience. I had only worked for really large companies. So I was pretty intentional in my research and looking for the specific company profiles that I wanted to work at. For the role that I started with at Jet, so my first role, um, I essentially manage our third-party marketplace for the toys and games category within the retail team at Jet. So the way that, you know, as you're navigating most e-commerce sites like Amazon or Walmart, you know, through the different categories. So if you want to shop for toilet paper or toys or, you know, paper towels, you'll navigate to that category. Each of those categories were essentially run as their own like small business units or PNLs at Jet. So I uh, worked on the toys and games category. It was super fun, very random industry. So I, you know, attended Toy Fair every year for a couple of years when I was working there and learned all about like silly putty and unicorns and all that kind of stuff. But it was really good time. And it was kind of the start of my like partnerships career because the marketplace job essentially uh, involved working with marketplace sellers and it was a commission model. So not so different from the affiliate uh, economics. 
Um, and if you to think of like one one big takeaway from your Jet.com experience, in, you know, specific around partnerships, does anything kind of stand out? Was there, is there an example of a really interesting, creative, transformative partnership that you worked on while at Jet? I think the one that definitely stands out is the partnership between Jet and Walmart and BuzzFeed. So that was actually what piqued my interest in working in affiliate marketing in the first place. Um, When I was on the retail team and the toys team, I had heard about a partnership that our affiliate marketing team was doing with with BuzzFeed. And essentially, BuzzFeed was doing such a wonderful job of curating all the like weird and interesting and useful products that, you know, one could find on the Jet or Walmart e-commerce sites. And so we decided to take that more like editorial driven partnership one step further and basically develop a collection of products together. Um, so there was a line of cookware that was tasty branded and carried on walmart.com, jet.com, and also in Walmart physical stores, which was actually a really big deal. And it was just such a great example of what started out as a more traditional, you know, relationship between an advertiser and a publisher and an edit and an affiliate capacity evolve and go deeper into this more multifaceted and much deeper partnership between the two companies. Now, tell me if you agree, but this has definitely been one of the, the biggest trends that I've seen, especially with major publishers, is that they've really gotten into the business of commerce content, even more so than advertising. You know, they used to just publish content, whatever news that they felt was fit to print. And advertising was in a completely separate silo to just build holes on a page. And a lot of times the the two weren't related advertising and content. Now it seems that the commercial content that these large editorial teams are creating now is the trend. You know, they are reviewing products, they're spotting trends, they're surveying their audience, and they're writing about products. And that is the main um, you know, demand for, for content from, from major publishers. I think BuzzFeed, in my experience, has been a pioneer in that commerce content space. They got a full-blown shopping section. Uh, they put a great deal of uh, time and effort into producing that commercial content, as well as um, primarily monetizing it through these affiliate and other partnership links. And on some pages, what I've learned, just talking with the, the former GM of Meredith Brands, you know, taking ads off a lot of those commerce content pages and just focusing on optimizing how they're they're monetizing through uh, the links within the the information itself. So it sounds like you were early at Jet.com and kind of discovering that same opportunity within within commerce content. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. And I think it was something that we were thinking about a lot, especially, you know, in my days at Jet and Walmart, we were, um, you know, we we also partnered with like Food52 and Britain Co., who I consider also really strong in this aspect, um, just like BuzzFeed is. I think it's super interesting what these publishers are doing and how they're developing, you know, their own lines of products. And I think it's so smart that they're, you know, leveraging the trust that they already have from their audiences and all the data that they have surrounding what their audiences and readers like to read about, what they like to buy. Um, And I think it's just so smart that they're just creating all these product lines to cater to that. Yeah, it makes me think of um, another big difference from the world of advertising, especially programmatic advertising, where you know the the brand who's advertising on that page, you know, through a programmatic ad, chances are they're never talking to that publisher. It's just it's just zeros and ones, you know, bidding at, at certain prices. In the world of partnerships, especially you know, forming a partnership with a team of editors as a brand, whether it's Jet.com or it's a specific product uh, within Jet, um, you know, that that is selling through Jet. You, you have to form a bond, right? There's, you know, those editors have to invest some time and effort into understanding the brand, getting behind the brand. And, you know, because they're risking their brand with their audience if they're authoring content, right? This commerce content that we're talking about. So I think it's just uh, interesting to kind of, you know, note that difference uh, in terms of how, how things are evolving. Yeah, it's a really important difference. And I think for us, like how that translates in my current position at Disney is, we try to educate the editorial outlets that we work with as much as possible on all of the content across, you know, in all of our, our new releases across all of the streaming services that we manage the acquisition efforts for. So what that means is, you know, my team puts together this really great, like fun newsletter for all of our publishers every week where we're essentially curating based on seasonality. So, you know, right now it's Pride Month. So what are all the, what is the collection of content on Disney streaming relevant to Pride? But it definitely takes a lot of investment of time on the brand or advertiser side to make sure that, you know, you're remaining front and center and that all of your editorial publishers 
fully understand your products and all of your new uh, new releases and and all of that. Yeah, and, and you know, I think a good segue here is to talk about influencers and creators and the role they play in partnerships. And the reason I mentioned them, a couple of reasons. One. I, everything we just talked about around commerce content, that trend with major publishers, I think they took a page out of the influencer and creator original handbook, right? Because they were the first ones doing this like 10 years ago, doing their unboxing reviews on YouTube and things like that and talking about products. And then they figured out, hey, they can use affiliate links or do branded content deals with, with brands as they're getting behind products and just speaking very authentically about uh, what they think of them. But like, what better way to reach a diverse audience. You mentioned pride, right? I have to imagine that influencers, creators that you might team up with. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. I think the need for more diversity in all of our assets is so important and one that we take really seriously at Disney. So for our influencer initiatives, actually our influencer channel has been really a pioneer within Disney streaming in terms of diversifying the types of talent and content that we feature in our ads, which is something that you know, my team is extremely proud of. For us, like we have a really broad definition of what constitutes diversity within our influencer assets. So, you know, obviously the most obvious issue is the need to represent more people of color, but we also acknowledge that our campaigns, you know, were initially skewed more towards like suburban over urban and rural contexts on the more like affluent and, you know, traditional in terms of like relationships and what traditional families look like. So we, we really strive to ensure that our, our assets have a, you know, good balance between, you know, males and females, different types of family compositions. We also want to work with influencers that are body positive, you know, non-white, um, that are non-binary and also disabled. So we actually set our own targets. So for our influencer assets, essentially our goal is to have more than half of them be sourced from talent that we consider uh, diverse across this pretty broad definition that I just went over. Excellent. I wanted to switch gears and you know, just talk about teams in general. What do you think is the right way in today's modern marketing, uh, customer acquisition sort of environment? How do you think teams should be, should be organized and especially uh, in the area of partnerships? So we oversee a diverse portfolio of, you know, essentially three or four streaming services across various regions globally. And that's, you know, across about 106 countries now. We've decided to take the approach of structuring our team by regional pods. That obviously is not going to make sense for a company that's, you know, more domestic driven or focused on one specific market. For us, it was a need because we essentially, and now I'll go a little bit broader on how Disney streaming is structured. We're really, um, you know, a matrix organization. So I sit on our global performance marketing team, which, you know, is primarily based in New York and manages our global acquisition campaigns across all of the markets where our streaming services are alive. But then we partner very closely with our regional team. So these are regional marketing teams that are embedded within this specific region and that are essentially meant to advise on the local strategy for their market, right? So my team, we're the global performance marketing performance partnerships team. And then we work with, so for example, APAC regional team on how do we adapt our performance, our partnership strategy for the Korean market or the Japan market or, you know, the Singapore uh, market. So that really makes sense for us. And kind of the, the thought behind that structure is that we want to have like a global center of excellence where we establish like global ways of working and we try to scale as much as possible the work that we're doing. But we want to make sure that we're tailoring it to local nuances, local strategies, you know. Um, and the other thing for streaming services is that, you know, content rights are extremely complicated. So we don't carry the same shows, movies, et cetera, on Disney Plus and all the different markets that we're live in. And so that means that our marketing needs to be very tailored to that specific market and that language. Typically, when I think of customer acquisition, revenue acquisition, there could be like a, a number of different marketing sort of strategies. So you've got SEM, could be display, could be Facebook, could be email, partnerships, um, you know, might be in a, in a different track. How are those teams. So if it's if it's mostly a regional breakout now, how are those sorts of channels within a region 
organized or, or working there? Do you see companies more siloed within these, these types of uh, teams or departments? Or do you see uh, more collaboration, do you think, happening here, especially around in the area of attribution? We really do our best not to be siloed. I think, you know, that was obviously even harder during the pandemic with, you know, working from home where, you know, it's really easy to default to, you know, doing just the work that impacts your team, you know, ending there. We really, really do prioritize collaboration between the various paid channels. So we're set up similarly to what you just said. So our global growth marketing team that I sit on, I have counterparts that manage our programmatic display and video. Then we have a paid search team and we have a paid social team. All of us are in meetings all the time trying to not only stay in tune with what each other are working on, but also find ways to collaborate between channels, right? So at Disney, we've actually coined a new term called AF play. I want to make sure that the, that the audience has got this right. AF play? Is that how you spell it? Yeah. So A-F-F-P-L-A-Y, at affiliate display. And basically, like what we do is, you know, the affiliate team and the display team approach publishers together, right? To try to leverage the true power of our of our investments and make sure that our marketing dollars are really working as hard for us as possible. So for example, we'll approach a publisher together. And, you know, if we feel that that publisher is not giving us the love that we need on the affiliate side, you know, we will leverage our direct display buys to extract more value on the affiliate side and vice versa. And then that just kind of leads me to ask a follow-up question, like the role of like technology or your analysis of, of the data to kind of understand what's driving incremental value and, and what's not or what's more valuable than the other. Can you talk about the role of technology or, or your approach to how you, you analyze those things? I think technology is super important. Um, we, we also have a MarTech team that makes sure that, you know, our teams are equipped with basically the high, the, the best tech that we need to be able to be empowered to do our jobs and get all the data that we need. Multi-touch attribution is obviously has its pros and cons. Um, that is what we're currently using to evaluate like our, our media um, internally, but we're also going to um, start looking more at MMM um, as well as, you know, we obviously continue to look at our last click uh, performance because that's what our affiliate partners see um, within the impact platform. So I think we have to be almost like fluent in a few different attribution methodologies and we look at them holistically to make our optimizations. In terms of other tech, I mean, I think, you know, there's obviously a lot of different vendors that we work with that help improve our day-to-day. And I think, you know, it's super important to stay abreast of all the changes that are happening and coming in in the ad tech space. Lisa, you've been extremely generous with your time. I appreciate you taking a few minutes to join us today on the Partnership Economy podcast. Thank you so much. It was so fun chatting with you, Dave. And um, yeah, I'm I'm really, uh, hopefully this will be useful for people. It was fascinating to hear how a massive entertainment giant like Disney has evolved over the past few years. As Eliza mentioned, the strong macro trends that emerged since 2020 played a major role in the success of Disney's streaming business. But there's no doubt that the innovative B2B partnerships that they've recently implemented contributed to their success in a big way. During the pandemic, Disney saw the writing on the wall and took advantage of the opportunity to make lemonade out of lemons. By partnering with global hospitality brands like Hilton and TripAdvisor, the brand found innovative ways to stay relevant with consumers and help their partners do the same. Eliza also shared her perspective on big tech disruption and how these changes are trickling down into partnership marketing. She reminded us of the value of doing our due diligence as marketers, keeping communication lines open between teams, and taking full advantage of the data that we have available to us as we navigate new partnerships and much more. Thank you, Eliza, for joining us on today's episode of The Partnership Economy, and thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to The Partnership Economy, brought to you by Impact.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to the show and rate and review it on Apple Podcasts.